Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship today. It is good to be in the house of God together. Um, we are going to hear this morning's prelude in just a moment. I just want to make one announcement before that, uh, in case you had not heard yet. Um, we did send out a notice earlier this week. Masking in church is now optional, even while singing. So uh, we do encourage anyone who wants to continue to wear a mask, by all means, do what's, what's right for you. Um, but, but that is optional for the entire service. So I just wanted to let you know that uh, as we enter into our worship time today. I invite you to center your spirit in God's presence in this place and in our hearts as we hear this morning's prelude. Again, good morning and welcome to worship today. Uh, I do want to share our announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I am going to be away this week. There's a group, a uh, small group from the church here is going to be doing some hiking. Please keep us in your prayers as, as we do so. Um, in my absence, any pastoral care needs or emergencies, can uh, you can contact the church office and Pastor Juhei Han and Pastor Darlene Wrestling uh, have agreed to cover in my absence, so um, please contact the office and they can put you in touch. Uh, there will be no Sunday school next week. It is 4th of July weekend, so please know no Sunday school next week. Also want to let you know, uh, we started handing out our, the stewardship team started handing out the mid-year statements. Those are available today as well. If you weren't able to be here last week and pick up your statement, uh, it will be available in the narthex in the foyer. Uh, there will be some, some folks from stewardship out there to help you find it, so uh, please remember to grab that before you leave today. Are there any other announcements? All 
right, then let's continue in our worship this morning with our opening song, Great and Mighty is He. You'll have the words on the screen. join in this morning's call to worship. Inspired by Psalm 77, let us call to mind the deeds of the Lord. You are the God who works wonders. Your way, O God, is holy. Lead us and guide us in the way of your love. We'll continue our singing now with our next song, Holy Spirit, Rain Down. Let your power fall, let your 
continue our praise of God with our next song, hymn number 152, I sing the almighty power of God. and possibility, set us free by your grace to follow more completely where you lead us. Let us not be held back by the fear of falling or the potential for failure. Grant us courage to march bravely forward, trusting you to guide us, and knowing it is you who brings the seeds which have been planted to fruition. You have called us and we long to be part of the good work you are doing in this world. May it be so, in the name of Christ. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, this past week, and uh, in fact, uh, today, uh, annual conference has been and is being held. We have three representatives from our church uh, who, who have attended. That, that is Dale Borkett, Douglas Ashbrook, and Kay Schrock are the lay delegates to annual conference. Um, so they are available to you if you want to, to know more about what's been happening. I want to read for you. I've, I've written a report. Uh, this is my pastoral report from annual conference. It will be available in print form in our next newsletter, but I read it for you now. I offer this report on the 223rd session of the New York Annual Conference. The theme of this year's annual conference was Restoration Revival, Resetting for the Journey. 
We were guided through our work together by the words of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his, to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. Much of the emphasis of this year's conference was on moving from a recognition of the suffering, the challenges, and the uncertainty that we are facing toward a productive way forward to a vibrant and vital future together. Now, one of the benefits of the New York Annual Conference being held in a virtual format this year is that I can direct you to nyac.com and invite you to watch the proceedings of the conference for yourself. They're recorded there. You can also go to the conference Facebook page if you want to go back and watch the, the, the uh, proceedings from the last few days. In particular, I would direct you to the Bishop's State of the Church Address held on Friday, June 24th. He touched on many topics weighing on our hearts, and I think his address is a fair summary of our overall time together. Our bishop offered his own vision and desire that we would be a church which would lead transformationally rather than transactionally. And if you're interested in knowing more about what that means, go and listen to the bishop. He'll explain it a whole lot better than I can this morning. And, and, uh, and I only got time for one sermon today. So, among the many topics covered was the recent split in Methodism and the formation of the global Methodist church. This split was not a main focus of our work together at, at the annual conference, but the bishop did take time to note that as of today, there are no churches in the New York annual conference that have started the process of disaffiliation for the purpose of joining the Global Methodist Church. Bishop Bickerton's desire is that we can invest our energies in finding a fruitful way forward together for the sake of our common calling, leaning into the strength of our diversity rather than investing our energies and deepening our divides. Bishop Bickerton also touched on the recent mass shootings and acts of violence, many of which have been fueled by racism and attitudes of hatred. He spoke with a great deal of emotion on this topic, as you might imagine. He assured us that the work of anti-racism will continue in our conference as a priority for creating an equitable community that reflects the inclusive values of Christ. The bishop discussed troubling accusations of abuse against the Boy Scouts of America and beyond and how they are affecting some of our local churches. He reminded us that we must not only be concerned with litigation and financial implications, but also with healing the deep wounds inflicted on vulnerable lives by these sins. Finally, the bishop discussed the sustainability of our annual conference and the real threat that we are facing unless we enter into God's transformative work. He noted again our annual conference due to an increase in the number of retirements and, and uh, just the fact that many pastors have departed from ministry, our conference found itself roughly 40 pastors short this last appointment season. He declared our conference's intention to unapologetically lean into our connectional roots, to reclaim who we are as a people in the Methodist tradition, and to strengthen our emphasis on the cooperative parish model of ministry. Uh, it's actually the cooperative parish model of ministry, which was a focus of much of our time together at the annual conference. The cooperative parishes are regional groupings of local churches organized under the leadership of a parish coordinator. I served uh, the last three years as a parish coordinator. I stepped down this year. Our parish coordinator is going to be Pastor Yun Tae Kim of the Mid-Hudson Korean, uh, Mid Korean Methodist Church right here in Poughkeepsie. The role of the cooperative parishes will be to coordinate and collaborate on ways to provide vibrant worship in as many corners of our conference as is possible, and to explore collaborations on mutual ministry between churches with a shared sense of mission. The idea behind this model is that we can do more together than any single church is able to do on its own. In the coming months, one or two lay members from each local church will be selected to represent their congregations on a new cooperative parish council. There will be work, uh, there we will work with other churches on how best to answer God's call and to serve the contextual needs of our communities. 
The way forward will not be easy, but in the words of the bishop, we must try. That is a direct quote. Now, one final note from conference is that our annual conference responded in real time to the news of the Supreme Court ruling to overturn Roe v. Wade. We recognize that there is a great diversity of thought and perspective on this complicated issue. We should endeavor to be sensitive toward one another in that diversity. And we, are, we understand that diversity exists not only in this church family. That diversity exists for some of you within your own families. That diversity of thought and opinion. And more than that, that diversity of thought and opinion exists within many of us in our own souls, feeling conflicted over this topic. A petition reaffirming the values of our social principles, declaring our concern about the reversal on established law, and in support of maintaining a woman's right to choose, understanding that there are particular and contextual realities surrounding that difficult choice, that petition was approved overwhelmingly by the members of our annual conference. Subsequently, the bishop published a response yesterday in which he urges us to enter, and I quote, a time of deep reflection, prayer, and mobilization as we continue the struggle to stand in the gap with intercession, advocacy, support, and grace for such a time as this. In the midst of our diversity of opinion, may we be one in our response to those who are broken into a world that is divided, end quote. Now, if you've ever been to annual conference, or if you watched it this year, or if you intend to go back and watch the proceedings, you are sure to see, hear, and experience things that you will disagree with and are uncertain about. I've been going to conference for a great many years, and it happens to me all the time. As a people with tremendous diversity, we are rarely of a singular consensus, but in our diversity, I believe that it is possible for us to have the singular mind of Christ that Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Our conference has never been represented by a single voice, not even a bishop's voice. It is represented by all of our voices. May we be a church in the spirit of Pentecost that even where we may be speaking in different tongues, we find an understanding and a connection that is stronger than our differences and our disagreements. Annual conference is simply not capable of allaying all of our concerns or our uncertainty. Thankfully, the annual conference is not our Lord, nor is it our Savior. We place, as we always have and always shall, our hope in God. God the Creator and Recreator, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Sanctifier and Guide. Thanks be to God. I submit to you my report from annual conference. Uh, as I said, if you have further questions, feel free to ask myself, uh, Dale, Douglas, Kay. Um, I'd be happy to, to, to share um, our, our, our own takes on, on the experience of annual conference. Although a couple of us are going to be gone for the next few days, so you may have to hold on to it for a little while. All right, at this time, we uh, turn to our first reading for the day, Galatians chapter 5. Our first reading is from the New Testament, from Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 25, the fruit of the Spirit. By contrast, the, spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. Do we have any children who want to come forward today? Please come on down.
Good morning. Hi. So I'm excited. You, I was hoping you'd ask why. I've got a new pair of flip-flops. I know that, that may not seem like a big deal to, to some people, but you see, I don't like wearing shoes. Um, why? Have you, ever, have you ever seen a dog that somebody put boots on? Have you ever seen how a dog that somebody put boots on walks? You've never seen that? I'm going to try to imitate it, and, and I'm, I'm, you're probably going to laugh at me. So when they put, they put the boots on, the dog just kind of goes like this. Because they don't, they don't know what to do with their paws or their feet. Um, that's kind of how I feel when I have closed-toed shoes on. It, it's just, it doesn't feel good to me. I like my feet as close to the ground as possible. Um, in fact, well, I, I, I do a lot of times. Out of, out of respect for, for folks in the church, I generally try to wear something on my feet because, you know, my feet are a little bit nasty. But, but... Um, there's actually lots of stories in the Bible. If you say, why don't you just take your shoes off? People took their shoes off in the Bible all the time. And in fact, there was a practice, an ancient practice, that whenever you felt like you were stepping onto what they called holy ground, you would take your shoes off to stand in that space. What do you... Oh, you are so smart. Yeah, so, so I was going to say, what is holy ground? What do you think that means, holy ground? Belongs to God. It belongs to Jesus. Yeah? So, so, so if that's true, if, if, if any ground that belongs to God is holy ground, then you're right. All ground is holy ground. Now, I'm not going to say that means that we should just go and and take our shoes off and walk everywhere barefoot. But, I know, I I, listen, I'm the one, if anyone was going to make that argument, it was going to be me. Um, But, to, to, to use that as a reminder that wherever we are, whatever time it is, whatever place it is, we can recognize that God is in that place. And if God is in that place, it's holy ground. And it doesn't have to be a church. This, just, just because we've got crosses all over the place and, and fancy bra- brass things on, on the altar here and, and pews, that doesn't make this holy ground. You, you could take everything out of here. It could be, in fact, you could take the walls away, be standing outside, and if God is there, what is it? It's holy ground. The church floor is holy ground. That's true. That's true. This is a special place where we recognize God is with us and we celebrate that. So yeah, this is holy ground. All all ground is holy ground. So let's let's thank God that wherever we are, we can remember God is with us and we are standing on holy ground. Let's pray. God, open our eyes, open our hearts, and maybe even once in a while, help us take our shoes off and feel the ground under our feet and remember that that ground is holy ground because you are close. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You guys can head off to Sunday school. Our second reading this morning is from the Old Testament, from 2 Kings, the second chapter, the ninth to the 14th verses. And they can be found in your pew Bible in the Old Testament section on page 259. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I'm taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet. If you see me as I'm being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. 
But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Elisha now succeeds Elijah. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Our centering hymn is step by step. You'll see the words on the screen. Gracious God, lead us indeed. Guide us by your word. Carry us into your truth. Show us the way, we pray. Amen. I want to start today's sermon with as brief as possible a summary about the prophets Elijah and Elisha. Because Elijah, Elisha, anyone else get a little bit confused by this? All right, I'm not, I'm not the only one. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to do my best here. It's still going to be confusing, but let, let's go for it. Uh, first, there was Elijah with a J, a prophet who boldly challenged false gods and evil kings, one of whom was a, a, a guy named Ahab. Uh, Elijah did this at great peril to his own life, especially from Queen Jezebel, Ahab's wife and woman that you do not want to be on the wrong side of. While fleeing for his life from Jezebel, God directed Elijah, with a J, to anoint somebody named Elisha, with an S, as a fellow prophet. Now, God could have saved us generations of confusion simply by choosing somebody named Frank. But alas, Elijah, with a J, Elisha, with an S. Today's reading from 2 Kings tells the story of the transfer of leadership from Elijah to Elisha. It happens this way. Elijah wants to, to, to make a quiet and solitary exit from life's narrative. He wants to slip away. But Elisha refuses to leave his side. Absolutely refuses. And so Elisha is present when what is described as a chariot of fire descends from the sky 
and takes Elijah up in a whirlwind into heaven. It's quite a scene. Elijah becomes one of only two people that the Bible claims never tasted death. The other is a guy named Enoch. It's in Genesis chapter 5. Go ahead and check it out. Not right now. Um, Maybe later. Elisha witnesses this, this amazing, this glorious ascension of his mentor, and he cries out to God in wonder, but not just in wonder, but also in, in agony because there is loss in this moment. And so after he cries out to God, he tears his clothing, the ritual sign of grief. Now that's the part of the story that often receives a great deal of attention because it's wrapped in a great deal of drama and spectacle. If Hollywood were going to make a movie about this, you can be sure that there would be a lot of scenes dedicated to this happening and, and lots of CGI special effects going on. Fire and funnel clouds and high emotion. But it's what happens next, an almost mundane moment that I want you to pay attention to. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 13 says, Elisha picked up the mantle that had fallen from Elijah. In a minute, I'm going to tell you what a mantle is and and what that seemingly forgettable act of picking it up would mean for Elisha, what it means for us. But first, I want to to share a story with you. It's a story I read this week. Uh, It was written by Carrie Mitchell, a Presbyterian pastor in Pittsford, New York, I'm going to share this story because I I think it beautifully captures the essence of this moment between Elijah and Elisha, the drama, the grief, the transition, and and the eventual, the movement forward in the story. It's a story about the composer Giacomo Puccini. Now, I'm going to tell you right up front, I am not uh, not an opera guy. Uh, John Burkett is not here, so he's not going to be here to check me on this. Oh, no, he is here. All right, John, I apologize in advance for anything I'm about to mispronounce. Um, I didn't see you there. Puccini wrote a number of famous operas, Tosca, Madama Butterfly, and probably his most famous, even I know this one, La Boheme. While he was working on what would turn out to be his final opera, Turandot, and I looked that up, and you are supposed to say the T at the end. I, I did look that up. Turandot, while writing it, Puccini was stricken suddenly with cancer, and he succumbed to the disease before he was able to finish. Before his death, he charged his students that if he should die, when he should die, that they were to finish his final work, and they did. And so in 1926, the world premiere of Turandot was performed in Milan, directed by Puccini's favorite student, Arturo Toscanini. During the performance, when they reached the point at which Puccini had been forced by his illness to stop working, Toscanini stopped the performance. He turned to the audience, and with tears in his eyes, he said, thus far the master wrote, but he died. And for a moment, the entire opera house was filled with a painful and heavy, grief-filled silence. Then Toscanini smiled and broke through the silence, saying, but his disciples finished his work. That story captures what what I want to call the liminal spirit of 2 Kings chapter 2. That word liminal refers to a transitional space. it's, It's being at the threshold of something, the boundary between what has been and what is about to be. Life is full of liminal moments. In fact, you can make an argument that every moment is a liminal moment, a space where we find ourselves between the past and the present. The graduates that we recognize today, that that we lift today in prayer, they are standing in a liminal space in their lives. The pastors who are appointed to new congregations at the annual conference, and in fact, our entire annual conference right now is in a liminal space. Many of you probably find yourselves in some sort of transitory space today between what was and what is about to be. And it's important for us to remember that these transitional spaces, these liminal moments in our lives, 
also have great potential to be transformative moments. Like Puccini's disciples who had to find their way to carry his work forward in his absence, as we return to, to Second Kings, we find that Elisha now faces the uncertainty of a future without his cherished master and mentor, probably asking himself questions about what he's going to do now. What comes next? The tearing of his clothes is the ritual expression of just how deep the grief he felt was. It's a sign of the sorrow which is overwhelming him. In fact, when you read that story, you can almost hear the sound of fabric tearing. And I imagine that sound followed by a heavy silence, not unlike the one that interrupted the, pre the premiere of Puccini's final opera. It's a silence filled not only with the weight of loss, but also with an air of curiosity, with an element of anticipation and possibility for what comes next. And what comes next, what breaks the silence in this story in 2 Kings is something so completely ordinary that it's almost dismissible. You almost forget all about it. You, you might even say it's just the next logical thing for Elisha to do, especially considering he just tore up his clothes. He needs something to cover himself. What better than the mantle lying on the ground in front of him, the mantle of his former mentor? And so he bends down, and he picks it up. This moment, despite appearances, is anything but mundane. The mantle that we're talking about was a form of an ecclesial garment, probably something called a talit, which was a covering that had a fringed bottom. It was not anything special. It wasn't something that would have been particularly valuable, uh, not, not in its own right. In, in fact, it's not all that dissimilar uh, to, to this stole that I'm wearing this morning, just a, a piece of fabric with, with some fringe on the bottom. You know, this stole believe it or not, doesn't have anything magical about it. You know, it's not imbued with some sort of divine energy that washes over whoever wears it and, and uniquely empowers them to answer the call of God on their lives. That's not how it works. This is not a ring of power from the Lord of the Rings. Uh, th this is not a cloak from Harry Potter. You know, in fact, go ahead. Here, touch, touch that, Gene. Touch that. Feel anything? Nope. Ray? You feel anything there? It feels rough. Yeah. You getting anything there? No? No? Okay. Well, if you did, it probably would much more likely that it was static electricity than, than you know, some sort of divine energy. Elijah's mantle that fell on the ground that day, there's nothing special about it. It was just another article of clothing. There's no mystical or supernatural power, just a piece of fabric that, that when, when God swept down with, with a chariot of fire and swept Elijah up, this fell to the ground and laid there in front of Elisha. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I have never been a big fan and felt entirely comfortable in liturgical vestments. You've probably figured that out by now. Uh, and by the way, liturgical vestments, that's a fancy way of saying clergy duds. I find that wearing my clerical collar feels a bit constricting. And besides, people tend to confuse me for a Catholic priest and start calling me father. And, and, and you've not lived until you've had a 98-year-old woman called you father. The robe, I sometimes wear the robe, uh, but defying the intended symbolism of simplicity, it, it feels somehow ostentatious to me. I don't often wear high vestments. I do on occasion, because there is value in it. Some of you, I'm sure, wish I did it more often. And yet, you may have noticed, rarely is there a Sunday when I don't wear my stole. 
three years ago when I was ordained as a full elder, despite my general resistance to ecclesial dress, I very much looked forward to having Reverend James Moore place a stole over my shoulders for the very first time. Not because I had any special kind of power or because it gave me some special strength or even because it gave me some status among the people of the church, but because that piece of fabric represents something that is significant to me about the, God, the, 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 the call that God has placed on my life and my responsibility in answering that call. I don't know what it means to you, but I know what it means to me. And so when I put that stole on, I'm trying to remind myself every morning that I come here that God has asked me to be a servant among this congregation. The mantle that Elisha picked up that day, that he placed on himself, when he put that mantle on, he, he was not covering himself with an article of clothing. He, he was not even covering himself with the legacy of his teacher and his mentor. He was covering himself with God's call to prophetic ministry. To be God's voice in a world of indifference and sometimes outright resistance, he was taking up the, the, the mantle, not, not, not a mantle of sentimentality, because it was something that, that, that his friend had worn. It was a mantle of courageous determination to carry on in the midst of his loss and his grief. It was a mantle to carry on in, in, in the work that Elijah had begun and committed his life to, even in the face of great danger. It was a symbol to remind him to carry on towards the future that God was now calling him to. We stand together today with Elisha in a liminal moment, a threshold moment between what was and what is about to be, taking up the mantle, clothing ourselves with that mantle is a declaration of our own desire to faithfully carry on the work that God is calling us to, the work that still awaits completion in this world. Each and every one of us has been called to play our part in that work. There is a mantle before each one of us waiting to be taken up. Now, here's the thing. God won't force you to pick it up. God does not coerce us into service or even into following him. All God will do is invite. The mantle is before you. Picking it up is up to you. To the graduates who may be joining us, to those who are stepping into a new space in their lives, to all of you who have come this morning, I want you to know that God is calling you to shape this world. God is calling you to write the story of our future and to be part of God's recreative and redemptive activity. All you who feel the weight of that space in between, either disappointed by or celebratory of what has been, or uncertain about or excited by what is about to be, will you take up the mantle? Will you make your own declaration of faith that where God leads, you will follow? By the grace of God, the one who calls us, may we all find the strength to make it so. And all God's people say, amen. At this time in our service, we are going to recognize uh, our graduates and offer prayers for them. Unfortunately, none of whom I think are able to be here with us today. And so we recognize them in their absence. And we, when we get to that point in the service, when we pray for them, I'm going to have you extend your hands out towards the walls of this church because wherever they are, we are going to bless them today. When we get to that point. Our Lord, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, Psalm 8.1. With the psalmist, we stand in awe and humility, O oh God, our creator of the good gifts you have given us in these graduates. We are so grateful for the blessing of their presence among us and for our own part in their journey. And now as they step forward onto a new part of their path, 
fill them with a deep and abiding knowledge of your love for them. Now I'm going to pause in the middle of this litany because one thing I wanted to do is actually name them. So I'm going to read the names of those who are graduating. These are the names that are submitted. I'm going to invite you to add any other names uh, who, who have not been listed. Alex Bessio, graduating from Western Connecticut State University with a, bachelor's, a Bachelor of Music and Audio and Music Production. Thomas Borkett, graduated from American University, Washington College of Law with a Juris Doctor. Daniel Gerlein, uh, graduated from Pace University in 2001 with her undergraduate in childhood education and 2002 with a master's degree in special education with a middle school extension and also a minor in psychology. Laurel Hicks graduated from Villanova with a Master of Arts in Theology. Alexis M. Hornis graduated from SUNY New Paltz, summa cum laude, with a BA in English. Rebecca James graduated from SUNY New Paltz with a BS in Art Education. Brielle Jones from Quinnipiac University, University with a BS in Psychology. Barack Tucker graduates with honors from Oakwood Friends School. And Dan Danielle Van Dam graduated sal salutatorian from Edmond Memorial High School in Edmond, Oklahoma. And I invite you uh, to, to share the names of any other graduates in your lives. Your grandson, Debbie's grandson. What's his name? Thomas Langdon. Langdon? Lang planked. I'm okay. Thomas. From Oakwood Friends. Okay. All right. Cosette Meter Shave. Thank you. Yes. Nicole Foreman from Spack and Kill High School. Ryan Espinoza, SUNY Cortland. Any others? For those and all the other graduates uh, that, we, 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 that are a part of our lives or that we know um, from our extended families and friendships, we ask that by your spirit, O oh God, they may tend to the world and help, it, to help set it right once again. Give them open hearts to feel its pain and courage enough not to be overwhelmed by its suffering. May they taste the joy of seeing your kingdom come in every corner of this planet. We ask that by your spirit, O oh God, they would add to the beauty of your world. Fuel them with holy curiosity and an imagination as artisans of word, song, and deed that comes to terms with both the wounds of the world and the promise of resurrection. We ask that by your spirit they may be nourished and renewed by hope, the good news that God is God, that Jesus is Lord, and that the powers of evil have been defeated, and that God's kingdom is coming even now. May mercy, beauty, and hope be theirs in this world for your glory. And now we speak this blessing, and I invite you to extend your hands in, in, in whatever direction that we may offer this blessing to our graduates. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now we celebrate in worship with our offertory anthem, uh, during which the offering will be collected today, Psalm 23.
praise you, O oh God, for so much goodness, so many blessings. God, may the blessing of this gift now offered be spread throughout the world. May it become a blessing to others that your good news, your love, your light may shine in the lives of those around us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Before you uh, take a seat, take a moment to turn to those around you and to share signs of peace and reconciliation and love. Peace be with you. And you are uh, welcome to take your seats at this time. We are going to, we have one or well, a couple orders of business to, to complete before we conclude our service, one of which is holding one another in intercessory prayer, uh, an important part of our life together. And so if there's any special need that you would like uh, lifted before God today, any special situation or person, you can put that on a prayer card, pass that to Will, and uh, he will bring that forward. We will pray for them today, and our prayer team will continue to pray for them on Wednesday morning. So um, at this time, let us join together in a time of prayer, and in this silence, these first few moments of silence, let us center our hearts before God and bring before God anything that we feel we need to. God, we thank you for the love that we know you are pouring into our lives, even in these moments of silence, moments to just be still and to know that we're not alone. God, we lift our prayers to you today. We pray for the group that's going to be heading hiking this week, uh, for safety and for good weather in the midst of this journey. God, we pray with gratitude for Cake House's first anniversary in heaven, for the new life that she experiences there in your presence. Continue to strengthen all who, who miss her. God, we pray for Laurel as she continues to recover from her knee surgery. Bring her back to wholeness, God. For the family of Lynn Bernstein who passed away, a friend and, and, and a local folk legend, God, we just pray that you would bless that family with everything that they need. For mercy, God, we pray your blessings of health and wholeness. For William, God, we pray for clarity of mind and thought. For Debbie Bellingham, as she continues her battle with cancer. May you bless her richly with your healing strength. We pray for, for wisdom. God, we pray for wisdom for all those who are making decisions, and particularly for a family uh, making decisions about education for their children. We pray for Bob. 
who having just gone through surgery just continues to need to know that you're close. May you be with him through the process of his recovery. God, we pray for families who are broken and fractured and in need of reconciliation. May you touch them with healing in those relationships. For the Corrigan family, in the anniversary of their son's death, in the midst of all the loss that they've experienced, God, may they find strength in you. May they find love in one another. And may they find hope even where it feels scarce. God, we lift all of these prayers to you, the one who is able, the one who promises to never leave us nor forsake us, the one who loves us with an unending love. We entrust them into your care. We entrust our loved ones into your care. We entrust ourselves into your care. And we pray all of this in the name of Christ, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn today is Here I Am, Lord. It's number 593 in the hymnal. I invite you to stand in body or spirit as we sing together this morning.
you go forth to answer that call, receive this blessing. Gracious and caring God, our source of light and of love, may your almighty hand be upon all of these, your beloved children, as they are sent forward into the future which awaits them. Amen. Amen. You can take a seat for this morning's postlet.